So I want to introduce Joe Doyle, um, and he's going to speak about healthcare analytics. He's the Irwin Shell Professor of Management and Professor of Applied Economics at MIT Sloan, and he conducts empirical research using microeconomic theory and modern empirical methods to answer policy questions, particularly in child welfare and health. Please welcome Joe Doyle. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, ever since uh, I've been at MIT and meeting with the other faculty members, speaking to people like Kate over lunch or figuring out how does change actually happen within a hospital has just always been um, just an amazing resource to have so many people at Sloan thinking about these issues from so many different levels. Um, so hopefully you'll see that as we go. So what do I talk to about today? Um, we're going to talk about re measuring returns to healthcare. So returns to healthcare mean if we spend more, essentially, do we get better patient health? So that's a production function. We're, we're trying to do new technology, new, new innovation, better doctors, better hospitals. If we spend more on healthcare, do we get better outcomes? And I'm going to couch it in terms of the research that I'm trying to uh, push on, which are developing randomized controlled trials, RCTs, and natural experiments. And we'll talk about what that means. So this is one of my favorite graphs I usually show. So here we have countries of the OECD, and they're ranked by the average life expectancy. Those are the bars. So you see Japan's on the left at um, over 81 years of age is their average life expectancy, and we keep going to the right. And then there's on the second y-axis there is the per capita spending in healthcare across these countries. And there's an, there's an outlier there. I don't know if you'd notice it, but um, <laughs> the United States, we spend you know 40% more than the next highest country, uh, according the most recent data, about twice as much as the average. So we're spending so much more than anyone else. And on this admittedly crude measure of, of, of health, we're not doing any better. So from this, and then not only cross-country comparisons, but across markets in the US, very high spending markets in the US spend twice as much as the lower spending markets, and they don't seem to get better outcomes in the high spending markets. People have concluded that about 30% of healthcare spending in the US is, is just waste. This is a very um, politically popular thing to say. That way we can slow the growth of healthcare spending and no one will get hurt. But when you ask people, well, what is it that's being wasted? Like just, if it's 30%, we should be able to identify it and just get rid of it. That's where the rubber hits the road. People have pet theories on it, um, but I haven't seen anything credibly showing where all this 30% is. We have a number of things that can add up, but we're not, we're not there yet. So that's part of what I'm doing in my research is trying to figure out, one, are there returns to healthcare, and two, where is the productive spending and where is the unproductive spending? So as the, core, the, uh, the title of the talk is Analytics in Healthcare, so you have to mention big data. So I'm contractually obligated to mention big data. <laughs> um, so you know, no one quite knows what it is. Obviously, we can think about it as unstructured data that wasn't originally meant for research. And that allows us a lot of opportunities, but also some, some pitfalls. But one thing that I like, we'd like to be able to figure out how healthy this guy is. When we're doing reforms, we want to be able to measure that. We'd also like to be able to prevent him from getting sick. So here we could go talk to him about, well, how fast do you, does it take you to walk up the stairs? We could send out survey people. It would be very expensive to do this. And then say, OK, um, take a hike. You know, let's, let's clock you and see how long it takes. That's going to be very hard to do. But if we equip him with this you know, very complicated piece of equipment called his cell phone, um, we can actually try to measure what's the altitude of the guy. And we can figure out when he's going upstairs. And we can measure how long it's taking. And then hopefully have some software in the back end that's monitoring all your patients. And, and then having predictive models that say, this person um, who has congestive heart failure now is slowing down. That's a marker for there's going to be an admission in the next two weeks. And so we got to get a nurse out there. We had to call this person with a video visit and get them uh, taking, um, taking drugs to lower their um, accumulation of fluids in their body. So the hope is, this is a big hope, and there's a lot of opportunity in this hope, to use big data in this way to try to improve healthcare delivery. Here's another um, graph that I'd like to show you. So on the y-axis is um, mortality rate. The x-axis is how much we spend on patients. And these are all heart attack patients from Florida. And here you can see if we spend $33,000 on this patient, they're twice as likely to die in the next seven days compared to someone that we spend 4% on. So obviously, we should cut back spending on healthcare to $4,000 and save a lot of lives. That's probably not going to work, as you, I'm sure, have guessed. The, the people on the right part of this graph here, they're just sicker. So when we're trying to estimate returns to healthcare, or um, even returns to, uh, to these new technologies, there's this undercurrent of we treat people differently so if they're sicker or, or healthier. So we're not randomly assigning, typically, a lot of 
major treatments that we're doing. And so we're, we run on this, what we call undertow of endogeneity is the econometrician term, but this major confounding factor is that we're trying to measure a relationship that's downward sloping and the data tends to be upward sloping. We have to figure out ways to trick the data to give us the right answer. So the two ways that I try to do that are randomized controlled trials and natural experiments. In the remaining time, I'll just talk a little about the work I'm doing in RCTs and then give you a taste of different types of natural experiments. And I'm going to put it to you to come up with some more and you can talk about it over, uh, over on the breaks of where, where we can get some natural experiments. So let's start with randomized controlled trials. Gold standard in research. We're going to have a treatment group, a control group. We're going to monitor their outcomes. This explosion of big data gives us an opportunity to measure people's uh, outcomes in a low cost way. So now if we want to look at the quality of life and how fast people are going upstairs, we're going to, over the next you know, 10 years, we're going to be able to try to track people in that way. The beauty of the RCT with, as the gold standard is that we get instantly credible and impactful research. So oftentimes it'll be uh, on a controversial topic of a research study that comes out that's observational and people will just sort of poo poo it. But if you come out with a, a study of, that has an RCT, then it instantly gets credibility. Um, some of my colleagues at MIT looking at the Oregon um, Medicaid expansion, which was done by a lottery, started thinking about, well, if we give people Medicaid, does, what does that do to their emergency room visits? Very controversial topic, lots of observational research on it. They do an RCT finding that ER visits go up, in that context at least. And so that's the best evidence we have, and that's sort of the leading argument that when you provide Medicaid to people and don't manage whether they go to ERs, then you're going to have an increase in the ER visits, not a decrease like some people had thought. So that's where we get, that's on the front page of the New York Times as opposed to the back page of the science section. That's the difference between an RCT and an observational study, typically. Now, healthcare intervention research, like pharma or medical devices, of the published research, 80% of it is randomized. So they get it. They've, they've been doing it a long time, and many of you may have been doing it. But healthcare, inter, uh, healthcare delivery research, I should say, um, where we're trying to figure out how to deliver care differently, only 20% of that is randomized. So that's what I'm making a big push to try to work with different providers to push on when they roll out healthcare delivery reforms to do it in a random way so we can rigorously test what works and what doesn't. So I wanted to just talk about two of my um, recent projects. One is in Camden, New Jersey, a very high poverty rate area. The Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers is led by Dr. Jeff Brenner, who's an amazing thought leader in how to bend the cost curve in healthcare. He won a MacArthur Foundation Award, and he's been written up in The New Yorker, I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Um, this idea of hotspotting. So one of the approaches for, with hotspotting was to get maps of Camden, and the red areas are where all the healthcare spending happens, and then just go in and figure out what's going on there and help people in those areas. A variant of that, and what I'm, I'm researching with, with them is uh, hot spotting at the individual level. So you find the people that are the super utilizers of the Camden healthcare system. You meet them in the hospital after they've been there for the second time in less than six months. And typically they would approach these people and they would enroll them in this program that lavished care coordination uh, on these uh, folks for three months. And this included sending nurses with these patients to their doctor's appointments. It included um, sending health coaches to their home to figure out what's going on, get them signed up for any benefits that they were eligible for, get them transportation to their primary care doctor. These patients are all on over five drugs at one time. They have more than five diagnoses. They have very complex health conditions. If you or I had these, this set of co complex comp uh, conditions, we would want someone from their team to come help us. And this is a very high poverty area with very low income um, ben um, patients that they're treating. And they, the, the, uh, the belief is that this is going to save a ton of money because if, as long as you reduce their, they're using the hospital so much and it's so expensive when they go in that you can, if you can just get that down by 20%, it would more than pay for this program. What's be the beauty of it is that Jeff Brenner wants to know if his program works and if it does, great, he can evangelize it more. If not, then he'd think about what to do differently. So he's teamed up with us to randomize patients. They were capacity constrained, so they were try sort of in an ad hoc way admitting new patients to their practice. But now instead of doing it that way, they're doing it on a random basis. So they get a baseline survey in the hospital, then on an iPad they click a button that says um, uh, it randomize, and it tells them if they're treatment or control, then that's how they get into the program. So we're going to compare basically identical patients that get exposed to different levels of health care at the end of the day. So we're, we have 150 patients in this trial now. We're waiting to get over the next year. We'll, we'll hopefully get enough patients to, to say something. But again, the beauty of it is we're going to get very similar patients getting exposed to different types of health care and see whether you, at the end of the day, help improve their health and reduce costs. 
And the way we're doing that in this low-cost randomized control trial way is by using administrative data. Instead of trying to survey people in RCTs, one that's very expensive, but also if you don't get the same response rate across the two groups, then that'll introduce a new confounder. And that's the whole point of an RCT is that you won't have these confounders. So by embedding these RCTs with administrative data, that's giving us the opportunity now to rigorously test these healthcare delivery reforms. Okay, this is a CT scan, scanner, and one of the main culprits that people point to of uh, too much healthcare in the US is overscanning. So obviously overscanning, if the, it's a low value scan, it's costly to do the scan. But also when you do the scan, you get false positives, you start cascading to more treatments. There's plenty of reasons why we think we might be overscanning and, and want to um, reduce that. Also, CT scans have a lot of radiation risk. Something like two to three percent of all cancers in the US are caused by getting too many scans, which is almost an incredible number. Um, so obviously there are benefits to the scanning and then there's costs to the scan. So how can we get to the right ones? Well, we're teaming up with Mount Sinai Hospital here in New York to roll out uh, clinical decision support software to physicians. So it's a physician level RCT. Some physicians in September, when they order a scan, they will, their scan and the indication will go to a web services uh, company, then they'll get a pop-up that says whether the scan is appropriate or not on a one to nine scale. And then we're setting defaults to make it easy for them to order the appropriate scan and harder to order inappropriate scans. And we're embedding this clinical decision support with a lot of hurdles, but also help to physicians in an effort to you know, get them to buy into using this program. Now, obviously everyone's going to have to use this program, so. Um, but whether we be very interested, and I'm sure Kate can help me think about how to deal with any res resistance that we're going to get with the clinical decision support software. The beauty of it, though, is that if we find if it works, it's extremely portable. CMS or Medicare is mandated by 2017. Every hospital in the country has to have some kind of clinical decision support when people when physicians order scans. And the devil's in the details, just like I spoke about before. How exactly should these decision support software work? And we're trying to, to do that. We start with Mount Sinai and with the successful model there, we're hoping to roll it out to an RCT to other hospitals. If it's the same type of program, we'll have a bigger sample. If it's different programs, we can start comparing what features of programs work and which programs don't work. And there's a lot of economics uh, that comes into it. Like we're trying to figure out not just are they reducing scans, but are they reducing inappropriate scans? But of course, physicians don't want to get a red. They don't want to get a, a one when they order a scan. They've been doing well on exams their whole life. They don't want to start getting a failing grade now. So they will change the indications. We know this from observational studies. They're not going to be picking indications that get you a red anymore. So we're going to have to measure that. We're going to have to think about the incentives that get created for what indications people put down. And we're going to be able to measure that gaming in our, in our approach. We're also going to look at um, whether it changes the course of care downstream. And if we find that we're reducing high cost scans but not changing the course of care, we're going to call that a win. Okay, so again, RCTs trying to get, um, it's um, you know, highly understudied in the healthcare delivery part of, health, of the healthcare industry. Get, and I'm trying to, uh, to thump the, uh, the bandwagon here for getting more RCTs done in healthcare delivery. So that's just a, a flavor of that and the type of research we're doing at Sloan on, on RCTs. The next part I just want to give you a flavor for is um, natural experiments. And natural experiments try to mimic a randomized controlled trial, but they use naturally occurring randomization. And RCTs have a lot of benefits. So one concern is that they typically tend to be small. Like we're studying Mount Sinai. If it works in Mount Sinai, maybe it won't work other places. What's nice about a natural experiment is that typically they can be much larger because they're taking place in the real world. They're not taking place at the most advanced academic medical centers in the world. They're taking place in just any old hospital. And then we can compare results across different types of hospitals. So we're going to use naturally occurring randomization. Today I'll talk about two flavors. One is diagnostic thresholds, and the second is ambulance assignment. So let's think about returns to healthcare for very low birth weight newborns. Very low birth weight newborns are um, 1,500 grams or less. That's three pounds, five ounces, for those of you who are um, metric challenged, I guess, um, which I was before I did that conversion on Google when I started the project. Uh, so very low birth weight newborns, if you go to neonatology neo manuals, it will say, well, if the newborn is very low birth weight, you should do this and this and this. You can hold the, the newborn a different way. You're going to do a diagnostic um, ultrasound on the, on the head to make sure that there's no bleeding. There, there are different protocols that, that physicians take up, ex exactly like my clinical decision support um, 
RCT that I was talking about, which is trying to get best practices or guidelines adopted, there are some guidelines for, for these VLBWs, very low birth weight newborns. So when we took five states of data, um, we zoom in on the birth weight distribution. So the x-axis here is birth weight from 1,350 grams to 1,650 grams. And the, the vertical axis is hospital charges, which is a measure of treatment intensity. Um, but as many of you know, that, um, that the, from those charges, that's the starting point of negotiations for what actually gets paid. Each dot is a mean um, for a one ounce bin, because annoyingly, in the US, um, much of the data are reported in ounces. So we're gonna have means for one ounce bins. And what you see from, uh, what you see over here is, as you get heavier, there's fewer charges, right? That's, the newborns on the right are healthier than the newborns on the left. This is exactly my point before, is that we treat sicker people uh, more intensively. So that makes it very difficult to estimate effects. Oop, sorry, can I go back? That's the... All right, so as you're going from heavier to lighter, it's going up sort of in this linear fashion, and then you see this jump right at 1,500 grams. And we sort of expected that because if physicians, some physicians at least, are following these manuals, then they would say, well, we need to do more things for these, this patient who's, who's categorized now as very low birth weight. So we see this jump. And remember the RCT was we're trying to compare apples to apples, very similar patients exposed to different care? Well, right at this discontinuity, these patients that are 1501 gram newborns versus 1499 gram newborns are very similar in terms of their underlying health. Yet one is exposed to more health care than the other. And in our, I'm only giving you a taste of this. We did you know, tons of checks to make sure that these are comparable type of patients. And just another measure, if you don't like charges, since we see that they're staying in care, this is jump in how long they're staying in care. As they get more done, to, uh, they're getting more uh, supervision, they're, getting more, they're spending more time in the, in the hospital. Okay, so now let's look at one year mortality. This is using nationwide data now. We have uh, 300,000 observations between um, 80 grams of, uh, just for these, uh, these six points here, we have about 300,000 observations. This type of threshold analysis requires a lot of data. Maybe not big data, but large data, let's put it that way. All right, so again, as you get heavier, you get healthier, so there's a lower mortality rate. But as you're going up here on the right side, you can see this downward shift in the, a discontinuity down against the trend in the mortality. And so by, we can combine the difference in treatment intensity with the difference in outcomes to estimate a return to care. Very similar patients, different exposure to health uh, treatment intensity, and difference in outcomes. And that's just one example of, of how we can use a natural experiment, the use of diagnostic thresholds, to compare patients above and below and get a return to healthcare. All right, let's stay with uh, newborns and think about postpartum stays, but now not in the uh, very left tail of the distribution, but just uncomplicated uh, newborns. And the question is about uh, postpartum stays. So how long should you stay in care after giving birth? And so when I was born, my mother stayed for like five or six days. Like that's incredible now. Like no one would ever do that because you get kicked out of the hospital as soon as possible. Different people have, diff different parents have different takes on this. I preferred to be there as long as possible. As long as nurses and doctors wanted to help, uh, help us transition to uh, adult, uh, to uh, parenthood, the longer, I, would, I was all for that. But other people want to go home. Now back in the 90s, uh, HMOs, health maintenance organizations, were pushing um, the lengths of stay down to one day. And so then there was a backlash against uh, insurance companies. There were a bunch of regulations that said, no, you have to allow patients to stay uh, cover at least two days for a vaginal birth and four days for a C-section. So here's data from California. I have on the horizontal axis the time of birth from noon. Um, as we, so yeah, here's noon, and then this is at midnight. And this is the number of additional midnights that people stay in care. Why additional midnights? We ask, how many days do you get covered for care? It's, uh, you get two days. Well, the number of days is the number of midnights you're in care. Okay, so what we see is that as you get to just before midnight, to just after midnight, we see a discontinuity, a jump in the number of additional midnights that you get to stay in care. And that's because the newborn born at 11.59 stays in care one day at least, a minute later. They're in care, they've been there for a day. 12.01, you're there a whole 24 hours before you're there one day, as it's measured in accounting data. So what's incredible is that this actually has an effect. So one in four newborns, we estimate, would stay an extra, extra night in the hospital because they're born at 12.01 versus 11.59. So this isn't quite as weighty as the very low birth weights for newborns, which they need you know, 30 days of NICU care. This is just for uncomplicated births, 
um, as we get a pushback of how long people should stay in, in the hospital, we can use this type of variation to get an answer to that. Because again, we think that the newborns at 1159 are very similar to the newborns at 1201. I mean, one idea you could think about is that um, you know this is to be true, so as a father, I would tell my wife, just hold it, hold it in. <laughs> just one more minute, honey, you can do it. And then I would be, I wouldn't be here today, I'd be a dead person, right? <laughs> I'd be one of my outcome, one of my one year mortality, I'd be very high if anyone tried that. So the beauty of RCTs or natural experiments is that, you know, we can have ways to think about, is it reasonable that these, new, these newborns are gonna be very similar to one another? And it is reasonable. That um, they're not, the other idea would be that you know nurses or someone are writing down the wrong time, which could happen, and we looked into that. And you could, there are many tests we can do, like the distribution, the number of observations doesn't jump on one side or, or another. We'd expect that to happen if there was systematic manipulation. In fact, the only one date that we saw systematic um, systematic manipulation, which was January first. All right, so any of you tax accountants out there would think, oh yeah, of course, you'd want to be born on December thirty first because then you get. Um, then you get the tax deduction for that year, which is great. But the, actually, people actually want to be baby new year. And you see an increase in number of births at 1201 only on one day of the year, which is, uh, which is New Year's Day. So I think that they need some um, financial um, help because they're, uh, they're giving up all of that tax benefit for just a few diapers from the local news agency. So it's probably not a good idea. All right, so this is uh, one or more additional midnights by minute of birth. Every red dot is every minute. Um, and this is just another way to show you that as you go to 1201, you get um, the likelihood that you're going to spend one or more additional midnights jumps. We're getting longer lengths of stay if you're born at 1201 than at 1159. And the other thing we did in an early part of the time period, there was, a there, was, uh, there was a law change during our time period. So we can look at newborns. Basically, the effect is going from one to two nights in care versus two nights to three nights in care. Which might not sound like a lot, but it's right at the heart of the policy debate about should we be you know, mandating coverage for two days, three days, one day, what should it be? And our research addresses exactly that. So here's one, very, one measure of outcomes, which is seven day readmission. You might think if you kick people out of the hospital earlier, they're gonna bounce back. But as you can see, um, the, the red dots are the means per minute and the blue lines are this, uh, just sort of a smooth line through those. And now we've zoomed in 10 o'clock to four o'clock. Most of these discontinuity studies, you want to be zooming in and comparing people right around the threshold. And you don't see a drop in seven-day admissions on the right, which you might have expected if, if we substitute a little longer length of stay with the um, having to bounce back, and we just don't see that. So we looked at uh, uh, different times of readmissions. We looked at mortality. So we're looking at do major problems occur if you um, get kicked out of the hospital at one day relative to two days, and we don't find that, which is consistent with what the HMO thought, which is they're probably on the hook for big expenses if they kick people out too fast, and um, they weren't seeing that. So of course, there are plenty of other outcomes as economists I would be interested in, like the satisfaction of the mother, or m myself, I, um, I prefer to stay in care longer. And so one of the limitations here is what outcomes can we measure? We can measure these sort of, did anything really bad happen? And as the data costs keep coming down, we're gonna to start to see more outcomes to measure quality of life. And that's really exciting from a natural experiment and RCT standpoint. Okay. Now again, I told you I'd just give you a flavor for lots of, RCT, uh, lots of natural experiments. And you could be asking yourself a lot of questions like, well, did you check for this, did you check for that? And, uh, and we did for most part, but I'm happy to talk to you more as we go. I'll give you one last one, which is, does the hospital choice matter? So if you have a, heart, have a health emergency, does it matter which place you go? I live equidistant from a community hospital and an academic medical center, and I, typically, I prefer to go to the academic medical center if I had to. Is, is that a reasonable choice? Um, what's the effect of costs and outcomes if I go to one hospital versus another? Now remember with natural experiments, you're trying to compare similar patients that are treated at different hospitals. So think to yourself, like, how would you get different people going to different hospitals? It's not that obvious how you would do that. Um, people choose their own hospitals. Back in the newborn example, um, the, the nicest, you know, sort of fanciest hospitals in Boston have very high C-section rates because they have very high, um, they have sicker patients, basically, patients that are more complicated. So it's really hard to compare outcomes across, across hospitals. So how do we do it in our natural experiment? We use which ambulance company arrives when you call 911 for a number of emergency conditions. And this is a, just a case study one. I'm gonna show you um, results using the nation as a whole, but I thought I'm in New York City, I'm gonna use my New York City 
case uh, example here. So Bellevue Hospitals in zip code 10016. And then New York Hospital St. Clair's is about 50 blocks north. And this is from a report that the New York City uh, Comptroller's Office put out. It was back in when Giuliani privatized um, ambulance services. You could get picked up by FDNY, or you could get picked up by a voluntary or private ambulance company. And, there are, and that uh, report argues that the, um, the patients are similar across these ambulance companies. If you got picked up by a voluntary ambulance company, some of whom had ties with the hospitals north of the, in the city, in that zip code, 10016, a quarter of the time they'd take you to the closest hospital, they'd take you to Bellevue. But three quarters of the time they're traveling 50 blocks north to other hospitals. If you got picked up by FDNY, then 61% of the time you're, they're taking you to the nearest hospital, and only 39% of the time they're taking you to the other hospital. So we did a lot of research with just this sort of germ of an idea. We, we surveyed communities, we figured out how ambulances are assigned to patients, and it turns out that the ambulance assignment is effectively random. If there are multiple ambulance companies serving your area, so they're both paramedic companies, they're both, um, they both have similar level of service, but they, they can, treat, they can um, come to your house if you call 911. The reason why one comes versus another is because that ambulance was physically closer to you at that time. And the way that ambulances are strategically located around communities, there's a lot of churn in where they're going to end up. So the fact that ambulance company A is closest to you, or ambulance company B is closest to you at the time you call, is effectively random. The other way that this happens is if there's mutual aid. So if you call and the usual company is busy, they're going to call in another ambulance company that's sometimes tied to the hospitals, sometimes it's from a neighboring community. But the fact that I called 911 first and you called 911 second is pretty random which, whether ambulance A was re a company was available versus ambulance company B. So we're trying to, again, mimic the randomized controlled trial by figuring out where do I get very similar patients exposed to different hospitals. So here's one, one piece of it was the ambulance company assignment is effectively random, and we have lots of checks to make sure that that's sensible even in our data. The second piece of that is that the ambulance companies then have to affect which hospital you go to, which doesn't have to be the case if they take all of our patients to the closest hospital. We're going to be focusing on severe emergencies, so you might think that's the case, like heart attacks, strokes, um, hip fractures. But it turns out that the ambulance companies, if they take other patients to um, hospitals, uh, Typically, they go to the same hospitals. For other patients, then if they arrive for, to pick up you, you're much more likely to go to their usual hospital. We can see in the data that the ambulance companies have preferences for where they take patients. And that's not so surprising. As we talk to paramedics, they're often on the phone or you know, two-way communication with ER physicians. So those ER physicians are making the call that you should go to the nearest hospital, Bellevue, or no, you have the time to come up to my hospital. And so that's where we can get this very similar patients being exposed to different hospitals. We get this shifter of hospitals for people who live near each other. So now I go to Medicare data, you know, terabytes of data from Medicare, like huge, maybe not, again, big data, but very large data. And we figure out which, we know which ambulance company picked everyone up. And so the y-axis here are the hospital costs of where the patients go, the average hospital cost. This is a summary measure of inputs for that hospital. And the horizontal axis is the hospital cost of where the ambulance company takes other patients. So if the ambulance company takes patients to two hospitals, that would be the, for that ambulance company, would be the weighted average of the average cost of those hospitals. Right? So we can characterize each ambulance company by the cost of the hospitals where they take other patients. What's this upward sloping line? The upward sloping line says, if you get picked up by an ambulance company that takes other patients to expensive hospitals, you're more likely to go to an expensive hospital. This would be flat if it didn't matter which ambulance company arrives when they picked you up. They always take you to the nearest hospital. This line would be flat. It wouldn't matter which ambulance company picked you up, but it does. The ambulance companies have preferences for where they take patients. So now my favorite outcome is one-year mortality, and the horizontal axis is the expected hospital cost, and I'm not going to get into the statistics behind it, but all the variation in my horizontal axis <clears throat> is coming from which ambulance company picked you up. So it's not about where you chose to go or where you ended up. It's about where the ambulance company usually takes other patients. And so you can read this as, as you get to the, the, the least expensive hospitals, the hospitals that do the fewest procedures, that rack up the lowest Medicare costs, they have the highest mortality. And then as you get more and more intensive, you get better and better, lower and lower mortality. And then maybe at the top there, the, bot, the top decile, it looks like the returns might be going away, that they, those hospitals are spending more, or making Medicare spend more, but they're not getting better outcomes. So we're trying to trace out where, which types of hospitals are getting better outcomes and which ones are racking up the higher costs. So again, just to reiterate, it's not a, that the patients that go to high-cost hospitals get better outcomes. They don't, on average. 
but that's because there's a lot of selection to which hospitals people go to. But when we put it through this new lens, new empirical lens of trying to compare apples to apples patients, patients just happen to get picked up by an expensive ambulance versus a less expensive ambulance in terms of where they take other patients, we see that those that go to um, higher cost hospitals get better outcomes. We see this is for average number of major procedures at the hospital. As you get to hospitals that do more procedures, you get better outcomes. There's the same downward slope. And we can use, the beauty of it is we have 2,500 ambulance companies in all these different communities. We can use each community as its own natural experiment now to unpack different parts of the hospital that matter. So are you interested in whether high volume regional centers get better outcomes? We can give some of the first causal estimates of whether it's true that it's better to go to a high volume hospital. Because we can see if you get picked up by an ambulance company that takes you to the high volume hospital. We're looking at outcome based measures. If you look at the risk adjusted mortality rate of the hospital, very controversial measure of quality. Um, then if you randomly assign patients that go to those hospitals, they actually do better. So it looks like those measures are being informative. It's not just that they're confounded by patient selection. One last one I would say is teaching hospitals. If you look at teaching hospitals in the just raw correlation in the data, if you go to a teaching hospital, you don't get that much better outcomes. But if you go through this lens, you see that those that go to academic medical centers, the one that I had a hunch was a better already, then we see that they get much better outcomes if you go to the academic medical centers. But you only see that unveiled if you do it through a natural experiment as opposed to just looking at correlations in the data. So I'm going to conclude now with, I tried to explain, but you know, most of my research is about returns to healthcare. And using data to drive this innovation is one of the, one of the features of this initiative that we're starting at, at MIT. Now correlations can be useful in big data, like how slow is it to walk up the stairs? That can be a warning signal. Very important to have these types of correlations in the data. But you need to have causal statements in order to make investments. So one idea is to just like push this guy up the stairs really fast, and then he won't have any problems. That's not going to work, right? Because it's not causal. It's just a correlation. So to get to causality, we'd like to do more RCTs, randomized controlled trials, especially in healthcare delivery, and exploit more natural experiments. So if you have more stories of where you think there are very similar patients that get treated differently, I'd love to talk to you about that. I'm, I can answer some questions about the research now. Did I convince you? Yes. I'm just curious, um, sorry about that, but I have a big question about of waste. Um, but what was your thinking around even identifying just these areas, right? Because you could have started anywhere and any, you know, like the relationships did you have with uh, like the, I guess Cam, I forget the name of the first group that you worked with, Camden or something? Camden Coalition of yeah. Healthcare, right. I'm just curious about your thinking around what aspects of cost did you want to look at and why? Well, the interesting thing about Camden, like I said, Dr. Jeff Brenner is a thought leader in how to bend the cost curve. And his idea, and it's like one of the leading ideas, is that you look at the highest cost patients and just go and lavish them with care coordination and try to give them support so that they don't have to go to the hospital or the ED every time they get hurt, they get sick, they can actually um, have their care coordinated in a much more cost effective way. So this is one of the big ideas in healthcare delivery reform. And so we partnered up with you know, the leader to figure out um, whether his program in particular works. Um, so that's, I think, pretty exciting. And if, that, if we're looking at other sites now, CMMI, the CMS Innovation Institute, um, is giving funding for other sites to do this type of care coordination for the super utilizers. And it would be great. To, we're trying to get them to start randomizing as well. So to see whether if it works in Canada, does it work in other, other places? So, one idea, so where do we get where the waste might be? We look at you know, what are some of the leading um, cases there. So in Medicare, for example, 5% of patients account for half of the spending in a given year. And 40% of those patients will be the same in that same you know, super utilizer category the next year. So some of them get less expensive, some of them will die, but there's this core group of people that from year to year, they're driving up the biggest costs in Medicare. So if you're looking to reduce 30% of spending, one idea is to look at where the spending happens. People like to think about end of life care. You know, tons of spending happen at the end of life. And we feel like if we ask people, do you really want all this spending? If you ask the, the family, they tend to want all that spending, all that intensive treatment. If you ask people, they say, no, I don't want the extraordinary measures. So the hope is that if we could get people with more living wills, for example, that say, I don't want the extraordinary measures, we could save a lot of money at a time when it might be particularly wasteful to be spending, spending money. And so we're encouraging RCTs of more interventions that would have that discussion happen 
earlier than in a, in a crisis situation where it's too late to sort of ask, do you want the extraordinary measures? There's a lot of hope that that's going to work. So we have ideas where it might be. We just have to now test it out and do it credibly. I bet a lot of people in the room have ideas. Oh, I know where it is. Well, then we, let's, let's show it credibly. You know? So um, that's one thing as an academic is nice for them. Uh, you know, if I had to make a decision as a hospital provider, I'd just make decisions based on the best hunches I have. But as an academic, I like to think about what, what can we show credibly works because we think that will have the most impact. If we, your pet idea you think works and you do it in your hospital and you show that it works, people will say, yeah, well, your hospital might be different than ours or maybe something else is going on. But no, if you do an RCT, then people start saying, well, actually, this is credible evidence. Let's see if it works. So I'm excited about trying all kinds of ways to uh, attack waste. Yeah? So how do you get back to our administration to take this type of thinking, which is go where the money is, and that's where you should try and save it, as opposed to just turning the whole system upside down. How do you get the administration to start hearing that? Because you know this idea of navigation and care coordination, et cetera, it's wonderful, it's idealistic, but we probably can't afford to do it for everybody, and who we need to afford to do it is the population that you talked about, the frequent flyers, and how do you identify them in a consistent way? It's not just a peak. They had their surgery, and now next year they go down anyway but that consistent group of frequent flyers. Right, so one, I mean, one thing I met he's good at is using data to model, you know, um, try to predict what's going to happen to patients. So, um, and Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers, they are, they like to use data to, to drive their innovations. And so they have uh, criteria for calling you a super utilizer and those guys, they do continue to be frequent flyers. They're not the ones that are mean reverting back to not using the healthcare. So they need at least five conditions. They have to be on at least five medications. They need to have been in the hospital at least two times in the last six months. They have a bunch of criteria that are good predictors of whether you are actually a frequent flyer or not. So how do we get people to listen? Well, who's on the hook for paying for it? So if we are changing the way we're paying for healthcare and, put, and get, putting more of the risk on providers, then I think providers are starting to listen more about how they want to um, reduce costs. So one example there is this readmission penalty that we spoke about earlier. So before the readmission penalty, um, so Medicare now penalizes hospitals if they have a high readmission rate. And that's because readmissions are costly for Medicare. And before this, this penalty, even though you know, it started off as small and now it's getting bigger and bigger, it's, to me, it's, I hear a lot more emphasis on trying to reduce readmissions since this penalty came in. And so hospitals are modeling, well, who's likely to be readmitted? They have nurses calling you when you get home to make sure that you understand your instructions. They're setting up primary care physician visits, making sure before you're discharged that you have a, dis that you have a primary care visit. All this energy to try to reduce readmissions, at least within 30 days. 31 days, you're no penalty, come on back. But th within 30 days, we definitely want you coming back to any hospital. Okay, it's on. <laughs> I have a question about the comparisons between uh, different countries because we are talking about the waste of 30% or cost that is higher relative to other countries. Maybe the easy way is to cut the, the, the income. We are all doing much better because we have a much higher income comparing the, the healthcare provider in Germany, let's say. Right, so we should all just get poor and then we won't spend a lot. I wouldn't say poor, but I'm saying... So that's a good idea. The, the, the comparisons. Did, did you do any comparisons with other countries? The same thing, apples to apples, and see the difference? Yeah, exactly. So a lot of health economists like to think about um, health as a normal good, meaning that if you get richer, you spend more on it. And healthcare is one of these luxury goods, and we st it definitely fits that pattern across countries and across people within the U.S., and so some economists think we should be spending 30% of GDP over the next 50 years on healthcare. So whether 18 is the right number, too high or too low, isn't clear. What we do know is that our federal budget will collapse if we do that. So that's where there's a pressure to, get, to stop it from happening. All right, I'm on red for about three minutes now, so I'm going to enjoy talking with you more as the day goes on. But thank you very much.